Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I will start the session first by acknowledging the country. On behalf of TRI, we pay our respects to the Turbul and Tregera peoples, the traditional custodians of the lands and waters of the Brisbane area. We recognize the continuing connection to land, water, and culture. We pay respect to elders past, present, and emerging. We acknowledge the stories, traditions, and living cultures of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, peoples, and coming to fostering a culture of learning from and working with First Nations peoples in the spirit of reconciliation and access to justice. Uh, welcome everyone. My name is Kavita Bisht and I'm an early career researcher at Marta Research. It is my pleasure to have Associate Professor Sally Ann Stephenson and Dr. Andrew Leach for this week's research translation of seminar. Uh, we will hear from these two speakers first, and then we'll have 10 minutes for questions and answers at the end. So um, Associate Professor Sally Ann Stephenson is a teaching and research academic at QUT. She leads a protein ablation cancer therapeutics or PACT group, which is currently part of the QUT contingent level three TRI. The PACT team design, develop, and test small molecules targeting post-translational modifications important to the function of cancer element protein. Dr. Andrew Leach is the director at Industry Engagement Health QUT. Since completing a postdoctoral research fellowship in the USA and earning his qualification as a patent and trademark attorney, Andrew has spent his career helping university academics to establish industry partnership and commercialize their research. Having worked at institutions all up and down the east coast of Australia. He has a broad range of experience in different technical areas, but as the Director of Industry Engagement Health at QUT, Andrew focuses on development and commercialization of therapeutic and medical devices through licensing and spin-out companies. Please welcome Sally and Andrew. So it's not something I'm used to being stuck behind a counter. So I'm going to have to remember, hi, everyone who's listening from, from um, wherever you are. Um, I'll probably start the, the discussion today and give you a bit of a timeline about Comeritech. Apologies for the technology. It's not working that fantastically. And then Andrew, unfortunately, has um, a bit of a cold and is at home. You can see him there. Um, we'll sort of bring him in and we'll talk about the commercial aspects and how we developed this company we call Comaritech. It's actually the very first time I've publicly acknowledged that I work for a company called Comaritech, actually. It's been a secret for a very long time. Um, and unfortunately, I can't actually tell you about any of the science that we do. Um, one day, we will, um, hopefully. But um, to, with respect to the timeline, the project really started in the first quarter of 2017 when we started doing some really cool work um, with a PhD student up the back there, Mahanan. He's not a PhD student anymore. He graduated. But um, we had this idea, and it was only an idea, and we presented it uh, not long after uh, to QT Blue Box, which was the commercial arm of QT at the time. Um, and only a couple of days later, QT actually had arranged to, uh, for us to meet and do a di disclosure to a group called Brown and Capital. Um, so two days, we had to prepare a, a fairly hefty presentation, which was very exciting. Um, but they were interested, but we were early stage. We're very early stage. It was pretty much an idea with a couple of slides of data. And so what QT Blue Box did for us was give us what was called go-to-market initiative funding. And they funded the project to continue after Mahanan actually um, submitted his PhD. Um, some of the important things that Andrew wanted me to mention was Mahanan has to have kept his research secret. So he had to present a PhD, um, give a talk at the end of that. And all of that was done under confidentiality agreements with the um, audience. So everyone came in and signed that they would keep everything a secret. And thankfully, it seems like they have. Um, but then basically, um, Mahanan's thesis is now under embargo. And the maximum time we could do that for was five years. So no one can even read Mahanan's thesis, unfortunately. But the GTMI funding gave us a couple of 
about a year and a half to actually find data and collect the data that we could then present. And we had a trip to bio in 2018, where actually Patrick Dwyer presented at what we called the PAT data. So it was non-disclosure, it was all very secret. We showed a bit of um, data, it looked really sort of funky. Um, but we presented to quite a few different companies in private conversations. And this was a little bit of a fact-finding mission for us because we have this technology that really could be applied to quite a few different proteins that are important in cancer. And what we wanted to know is what these companies were interested in with respects to that. So we wanted to make sure that we were generating data that was going to be relevant to the biotech industry. And we chose a couple of targets based on that and continued to work through but then gained a lot more data, it was looking pretty good. And we basically had uh, several pitches to groups like Brown and Capital. Um, we went down to Adelaide, we went to Melbourne a couple of times. Um, we presented to other groups, obviously, uh, all around the world. And we ended up um, again presenting or going over to bio um, and just checking we were on track and everything was looking good. So the, we had an agreement with Brandon then, but we had to complete some proof of concept um, studies, which we did. And then QT signed a research agreement with the MRCF through Brandon Capital. So that enabled us to start the company that we call Comaritech. I won't tell you what Comaritech means because it'll give away what we actually do. <laughs> and don't look it up, please. <laughs> but the company actually ended up being founded in February 2020. So one of the things that I wanted to sort of stress in this is that is a very long time. From the, the day we started talking about what we had to the day when we actually formed the company, it felt like a very long time. Um, but we've been working now since February, although we really only started when we got out um, two further key uh, research members. So Mahan and myself and myself were the co-founders, but we employed Carson and Mel to be part of the research team. So there's really three of them, although I say there's four of us. And they do all of the work and I stand up here and hopefully, well, I don't present it yet, but I will one day. So <laughs> come back in a year or so. Um, but where we're in now, we're actually finishing up Trench One of Funding. So it's, it's taken a couple of years now, or really, I would say 18 months. We have one month to go, but in that time, we've um, generated a database of potential targets for our technology. And we have at least one heat molecule to one of our novel targets. So we've, we're feeling pretty good about what we've done over the last 18 months to two years. And of course, it's the worst time in the world to actually start a company. Um, with COVID, February 2020 was exactly when we started. So we had all of the problems with shutdowns and sourcing reagents and plastics. And, and actually, the war in Ukraine has caused a few problems as well, because those of you who work with small molecules will know that one of the biggest companies in the world is actually based in Ukraine. And it's really hard to get chemicals now. So, um, but we've been going quite well, I think. We're, we're kicking some goals now. So I'll just go back because this whole talk was actually meant to be about translating research into a commercial thing. And it's really Andrew's, sorry, Andrew, I'm talking to you up there because that's where you are in my perspective. <laughs> but um, it's really sort of Andrew's sort of show here. So I will shut up and let Andrew take over. Thanks, Sally, for a, a really good overview of, I guess, you know, the, the journey that, that Kamara Tech's been on. And, Thank you to TRI for uh, asking us to, to talk about the, I guess, the, the, the journey here that we've been in translating the research. So what I wanted to do here is just work through a couple of the key steps and really talk about the role that the, you know, Sally and her team had as the researchers and then uh, myself in just engagement. And I see Patrick Dwyer's on call today as well. And the, the role that we had as the commercial people in the deal to moving this project forward um, to to get to well, where we are now, which, which well, I guess we're partly down, down the road of commercializing the technology. So if we go back right to the start of the journey when um, Sally had the conception, um, the key thing from a commercial uh, perspective for us was Sally did a really good thing. She knew she was onto something, you know, really quite clever here. And she deliberately decided not to publish uh, 
any of the data that she had amassed. And you know, that's always uh, a hard decision for a, a researcher to make. Publications are you know, uh, part of the course in, in what you have to do to, to keep your career going in academia. So uh, Patrick and I were really grateful that Sally had the foresight to, to not publish and keeping it confidential was really uh, a, a very key element of us being able to, to start this journey off. Um, given the nature of the technology, we couldn't file really any effective patents at the stage the technology was at. So really confidentiality was the only weapon we had to, uh, to retain value in the, uh, in the technology. Sally, any, any uh, comments from you on, on keeping it confidential at that stage? <laughs> no, I think anyone who's a scientist in this room will know how important publishing is. And it has been very, very difficult to keep the research going while not being able to talk about it. And uh, there were a couple of events where I was trying to get funding through the usual, um, you know, grant-based systems where I was just not, I was told I was not going to be successful because I just didn't have a track record. And the reason I didn't have a track record was because I had deliberately chosen not to publish any of this. And it's a journey that Mahanan came with me on because he hasn't been able to publish either. And, you know, it's, um, it's a big thing for a new researcher. So, I mean, he can say that he was involved in a startup biotech company, but, you know, if we don't go any further, then, you know, he was involved in a startup biotech company. Uh, sure. uh, yes. Hang on, Andrew. Sometimes it's really hard um, just to prevent a whole lot of talk, you know? um, I mean, not, not publishing, but, you know, when you talk to colleagues or whatever. So how can you get to um, that there's no leakage of information? There? Yeah, so, I mean, one of the things is we don't talk a lot about what we do. And I, I'm sort of pleased to see there are some QUT people here. They're probably wondering what the hell I'm doing standing up here. Because, to be honest, a lot of them wouldn't have known very much about what we're doing at all. Obviously, I had to share that with some people, and QT, as an employer, does have a confidentiality agreement as part of your contract when you sign on. It's not always reminded to people, but we have been careful about who we talk to um, and how widely we talk about it. And we certainly we have a research group. Um, we've extended that to a couple of the research leaders that we work with. Um, and obviously getting information and feedback about the experiments we're doing is really, really important. But these people understand the confidential nature of what we do. So, yeah, it's the whole process is actually very, very difficult. Um, but I think, you know, I think if you have faith in what you're doing, you know, you know that one day you have a real potential of producing something that's going to help someone, but that you can't realise that goal if you tell people about it. You know, you keep it secret. And that's what we've done for maybe seven years now, I think, Mahanan. Seven years. <laughs> but, you know, we're both committed to this, as, as is the rest of the team. So hopefully we'll see it through and one day our products will be helping people with cancer which is what I think we all hope. So, back to you, Andrew. Yeah, can we advance to uh, the next uh, point? You can. Okay, so a, a very important part of any commercial assessment um, of a technology when it comes into, well, what was Blue Box at the time, but industry engagement at QUT now is, is that first step for us is really performing that due diligence. So this is, uh, an absolutely vital step. If we, if we, the technology fails this due diligence step, it really can go no further uh, for, with us for commercializing it. So that's really working out, you know, who owns the technology. In this case, it was co-invented by Sally and Mahanan. Um, so uh, a QUT researcher and a QUT uh, PhD student. So one of those, the first key thing that we had to do was actually uh, make sure Mahanan had signed his um, uh, uh, student assignment and confidentiality deed. So that was one of the first things to consolidate uh, the stuff. And then we looked at other grant funding that may have gone into the project to make sure that QUT had 100% of it. And now if, if in an occasion, if there's other grant funding that where maybe ownership is, you know, split between universities, that's not a, a death knell for any technology. But what it does mean is at that step, we have to talk to everybody who's 
a potential owner of the technology and we have to consolidate it, sometimes not ownership, but uh, consolidate commercialization rights to one entity. So we have the ability to move forward with it. If you only own half a house, um, you can't go out and rent the whole house is the analogy I like to use there. So due diligence, very important first step. Uh, we then went on to commercial assessment. Um, Patrick uh, did a lot of this work very early on. Um, with a platform technology such as Sally's, the, the question always is, well, you've got such a wide platform and we've talked about hitting cancer drugs, but this technology could very well hit drugs in many other indications because Sally was really a, a cancer biologist. That, that's where we went down first. But some of those first very key commercial questions for us were, you know, a, tech, a platform technology, what are we going to do and what are we going to target? So a lot of work really went into that. Uh, that was done inside Blue Box, inside QUT. But as much as we could, uh, as Sally already alluded to, we spoke to pharma companies, um, com you know, with non-confidential disclosures, and we tried to get key targets that they were looking at hitting that maybe our technology uh, would do a better job of uh, knocking out these targets um, in, in disease. Um, the big problem for us at that stage, I think, was really we couldn't talk about the technology even under confidentiality. We weren't, we weren't convinced that um, a big pharma company wouldn't take what we told them under com confidential uh, discussions and then just move on without us. It would have been very hard to legally defend the technology. So that was a, a key step. Uh, Sally, any, anything to add on that one? Oh, no, only that um, when we first started talking to Blue Box, we actually filed a patent on the idea and we obviously didn't progress with that patent um, because we would have been then talking about what we were doing far too soon with the development of the technology. So, yeah, secrecy, very important. Yeah, that, yeah that's a key step. And uh, the other thing, we did file a patent, but we because it was a platform technology, we uh, this a couple of key aspects to patterning. Um, the invention has to be novel and inventive, and it also has to have utility and be enabled. At that stage, we weren't sure how broad a patent we could get. So we, we weren't prepared to progress a patent where we maybe only got limited claim sets. And I think at that stage, we only had data really that partially showed uh, enablement for the pattern around one target. So it was a really difficult decision, but uh, when we got the, the funding in, we decided to pull the patent back and work, work away in, in uh, secrecy to try and build up the data set for uh, eventual uh, patent filings down, down the line. Uh, next, uh, next, next point, please. Okay, so development. Um, Sally's already mentioned this, but this was a really key step. Well, when, when Sally came to Blue Box, they had a bit of a concept, a little bit of data. From that initial conversation we had with Brandon um, by, a uh, by a catalyst, we knew we we're going to have to build up a bit more of a data pack to convince anyone to take a chance and invest on this technology. So uh, in this case, um, Blue Box had, um, had ability to put funds into a project. Um, we actually went well uh, above what we can normally put in a pro into a project just because we liked the technology so much and we saw it was it had so much potential and there was just a massive commercial opportunity if we could get um, build up enough data pack to get a serious funder on board. So uh, I think any for any university or institute, having uh, the commercial office having ability to put um, funds in that kind of go past where you might get your traditional competitive grant funding in to get you to a point where commercial players will come on board is a really key key element for commercialization uh, across Australia at this point. Uh, Sally, any comments on, on that one? Only that that was incredibly important to the development of the idea because if we managed to keep Mahanan going, who was the absolute best person to be pushing science because he was he developed it already. Um, and yeah, I think, um, you know, we, we talked to a couple of other VCs about what we were, not what we were doing, but what sort of texts and, and where you needed to be in the stage of development. And a lot of them were saying we wouldn't touch you until you had animal model data. And we, we weren't even close. We had an idea. So, you know, we, we really needed that funding and it was really, really important. But um, any 
you know, I was trying to scrape together money from all over the place, um, little pots of money and 10,000 here, 15 grand here. But, you know, eventually, yeah, it was worth it, hopefully. Yeah, that's all. Okay, excellent. Uh, next, next point. Okay, marketing and pitching. Um, we've kind of already talked about this a bit, but um, this was certainly led by probably Patrick and myself in pulling together what data we could present, making sure we didn't give the idea away. So we needed to uh, attract uh, some sort of funding partner, but we had to be very careful about what we told uh, these funding partners about the technology, sometimes even under confidentiality. Um, as we've mentioned, we spoke to a lot of pharma partners uh, all those talks uh, at the bio conference, they were all quite interested, but they wanted to see more data. And in this instance, even with the CDA in place, we didn't really feel confident disclosing the intricacies of how the technology worked for them. So that ruled out a whole bunch of really strategic partner funding options for us. And we came to the conclusion that we really had to go down the route of trying to get uh, a venture capital investment into Camaratec. Of course, we could disclose to them fully uh, without them running away and then trying to replicate the technology without us. So in this instance, um, that, that was really the only path we saw. Um, I think both uh, commercial and researchers played a vital role in actually well, all the steps leading up to now, but particularly the marketing and, and pitching. We, we helped shape Sally's ideas into like a, a commercially appealing prospect. But then when we got through to, to pitching uh, to, to Brandon and so on, uh, Sally, I think, blew the, the venture capitalists away with her, her engaging pitching style. So um, while you need to have the data, uh, you also have to be really prepared to sell the technology as well. And Sally did a really good job at that stage. Uh, comment, Sally? I don't think I need to say anything. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. But I mean, it was a fun process. We we were sent down. We had pitches in front of fifty people. Then we'd have a pitch in front of six people, and it was all quite um, you know different. Um, some of our audiences had a lot of science. Some of them had none. So it, you know, <laughs> you have to adjust to your audience. Um, I think it was it was a really interesting experience for both Mahan and myself. Mahan came along as the co-founder, equal partner. Um, it's important that you know he got involved, but I did all talking. As you should. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no. Um, going to bio, Patrick handled everything, so all of the, the meetings that we had. I, I think at that stage, both Patrick and Andrew were probably a little worried I'd give secrets away too easily. Um, we de-identified everything. So we showed them data, but we didn't show them what the technology was. We didn't show them what our targets were. We certainly didn't show any molecules um, and, and things like that, which is why, as I said to, before, you know, it was really a fact-finding mission for us to find out what targets they might be interested in. That Then we could go back later and say, well, now we've got, here's our technology, here's the target you wanted. Now are you interested? But, um, but I think... Um, yeah, obviously going to a VC was the best option for us at the time, as Andrew said, so that's it. Okay, uh, yeah, next point. Okay, negotiation and legal. So this is really the, the fun part or sometimes the, the, the very not fun part for the commercial people. Um, yeah, uh, so we, we got the investment. It, it was a, a sizable first, um, uh, first tranche of investment really. Um, Patrick and I went through a very arduous process uh, negotiating a bunch of terms uh, around six different uh, legal agreements that went into forming this startup company. So I, I remember both Patrick and I were doing this in the depths of um, COVID lockdowns and we were literally working, you know, 10 to 12 hours a day, just going through legals, going back and forth. We had a, a very good lawyer on our side forming, you know, what we could and couldn't accept in these agreements and then going back to the, uh, the partner and having these very long um, technical arduous discussions with them about, you know, what we could and couldn't accept. And it's never, oh, we can't, we can accept this point, but we can't accept that one. There's a array of term, terms in legal agreements. And sometimes you can give a bit of ground in some legal terms for the other part, for the partner to get their way, if you then get your way on a bunch of other 
uh, terms that are maybe more important to you. So there's a whole lot of things that go into that. And, and one of the key aspects is, of course, negotiating the pre-money value on the technology as well. Um, that's a really important factor at this stage because uh, QUT would go in, obviously, as a minor shareholder. When you get a VC investment, often uh, they always want a controlling interest in the company, and that's, that's accepted. That's how it is. Uh, the person with the cash is king, so they get to set a lot of these terms. But we just wanted to make sure we set this venture up for long-term success. Um, and for that to happen, both parties really need to be need to be happy. So it needs to be a win-win between the, the funding partner and QUT as well. But the third win is really the researchers who put you know, their heart and soul into the, the, um, the development plan as well, they have to be a winner out of this as well. So a lot of the things we do when we negotiate these agreements are really for the, be well, for the benefit of QUT, but the researchers as well. Sally? Uh, I don't know what you want to say. I don't know what to say about the legals. I mean, we knew it was going to happen. We knew what the, the situation was. We wanted to progress the science. We signed all the agreements. So... It's really what it was. So, yeah. Yep. Excellent. And uh, final point, please. Okay. So, the spin out RD program. Now, the interesting thing about this, and this was obviously, of course, uh, led by Sally with input from our, our, our investor in this case. What we, I think we initially pitched to um, Brandon Biocatalyst as a research plan really got totally. Uh, reinvented after they agreed to funding the project. And even throughout the project now, as it's been going on, it's, it's been shifting, hasn't it, Sally? I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, um, and I think that's the, maybe the key point I want to make here is it's uh, commercial funding. It, it's not grant funding. You don't get your chunk of money and then kind of go along. And if some, you know, an interesting detour comes up, you're not really in control of whether you can go down that path. Everything is really controlled by the person that put the, the money into the company. Um, so it's, while commercial funding can be great for a project, um, it's got its limitations as well, I would think. Um, it, it can be really difficult. Uh, and sometimes you can even prove your technology, but the commercial aspects of it don't work out. So even though you've got an idea that, you know, scientifically it's got merit, it works, it might be able to help people. If there's not a commercial eventuality at the end of that, um, your funding might be pulled as well. So it is, uh, I think commercial funding has its challenges as well. Yep, Sally's, Sally's nodding. Um, <laughs> yeah, she's sat here waiting to say something. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. I absolutely, um, yeah. It, the, the disconnect, or it's not really a disconnect, the difference between academic versus commercialization, funded research is huge. And I think a year ago we were told, you know, this would be a great target for you to work on. And from a biology point of view and, you know, from the reading that we did about this target, we thought, no way in hell. But it wasn't really presented as you could work on this it was you will work on this and um and some of the targets that we would really have liked to work on we got told well no they're not commercially viable enough um we're just really lucky that the team have made it work and we're in a really good position now with a really novel target that no one else in the world is really working on so you know it might actually have turned out to be a fantastic thing so <laughs> You know, but it was, it's been a scary time, to be honest. Um, yeah, but, I mean, it does prove our technology, which is great. It does identify an option to target a new um, novel target for, for cancer biology. It could actually turn out to be something amazing. So we'll have to wait and see, but it's been scary. So you mentioned that you had a new molecule to this new target. Yes. Uh, secret, Neil, we don't talk about it. <laughs> No, it's still a secret. So, yeah, no, actually, the a really nice piece of data only came through on Friday afternoon. So, I, you know, I can't tell you about it, of course. But... <laughs> well, there you go. There's something in that. But yeah, no, it's it's. Um, I mean, we're we're coming up to the end of our first tranche, and we were in the right position then to get these sorts of pieces of data, and they are starting to come, and we're feeling pretty positive about it. So it's really good. 
sorry, can I just, I mean, this must be an amazing um, Everest to climb. You know what, you're, you're selling a, a black box, which is a blue box, <laughs> to, to somebody who then demands that uh, this target has commercial value 10, 10 20 years down the track, and there's a uh, pleasant market value. If you can do that, you can sell everything. What do you want me to sell? <laughs> no, it's it's the idea is pretty sound, and we had a lot of really nice data to to back up the idea. Being able to apply it to a quite a different protein has been quite challenging, and there have been times where we haven't felt very confident. But in amongst doing the work that we have been paid to do, we've also um, we've developed a database of other targets, for example, you know, and the company did fund that. Um, they funded the development of an assay that we can use to test those targets. We um, developed another assay to rapidly prove what part of the target we should be targeting, you know, those sorts of things. So it hasn't been, we're not a one trick pony. We're, we're ready to have a platform. And in fact, we are trying to have a platform as a platform company. So yeah, but selling it, <laughs> they could see the vision. You know, once you actually see the data, you can actually look at the data, and that's the problem with all this secrecy. You know, it's pretty special, actually. I think it's special. And I'm very biased. Yes, okay. <laughs> but, you know, one day, hopefully other people will see it special too. Sorry. Do we have any other question from the audience? I'm just going to check on Zoom. Uh, there's a question for you, Sally. Oh, so the question is, how certain were you that you had something concrete when you contacted Blue Box about your idea? <sighs> well, um, I had actually started a biotech company in my former life down in Adelaide. Hadn't gone very far. Neil Finlayson knows exactly what I'm talking about. She was there at the same time. Um, yeah, it, it wasn't quite the venture that I sort of hoped it would be. So, but I'd had a sort of foray into this sort of area before. And then um, we'd had a similar idea earlier that we presented to the former Blue Box. So Blue Box went through a few management changes and people came on board. So people like Andrew and Patrick. And then we, we still had this idea, but we took a slightly different tack on it. Um, and, you know, went small molecule instead of what we'd been doing with peptides. And uh, we ended up then presenting to Patrick. I was at work at eight o'clock on a Monday night, completely cheesed off at the entire world. Um, I thought, how can I possibly get funding if no one says that I have a track record because I'm trying to keep everything secret? And I ended up looking at the Blue Box website and there was a box there that said, give us your ideas. Well, it didn't say it like that. It was much more fancy, but it was basically asking for ideas. And so I wrote a paragraph and I sent it off. And it was the very next day that Patrick said, I saw what you write, we need to have a chat. The very next day after that was a Friday afternoon. Uh, I've lost a few days here, but anyway, it was Friday afternoon that Patrick came and he looked at all of our data. I'm sure Mahanan remembers that day as well. And then it was the Friday, the Monday morning, two days later. So there was a weekend in between, but Patrick had still managed to organise for us to present to the, a rep from by, um, Brandon Capital. So that's how excited they got from a paragraph on a Monday night, eight o'clock on a Monday night, when I was just completely cheesed off at the whole world. So <laughs> that's where we started. <laughs> so I hope that answered your question. I think we hope we, is there any more question? No. Is that gosh that you presented to? No, no, no. no. It was um Chris, someone maybe a prior to a prior to Goss, actually. Yeah, it was, it was Chris. Yeah. Prior to prior, yeah. So um, at the same time, Brandon was going through quite a few changes with who was representing them in Queensland. So yeah, I presented I think to three different people in the end, but yeah, um, Michael or something as well. Um, Michael Bettis, but yeah, that one. yeah, it was the Chris Smith of the. And they brought, I don't know if you met Roberto, he, they brought him out and we presented to him, he's a lovely guy. 
And oh, actually, I should say as well, one thing that Brandon has, you know, having this commercial funding has really given us is our Chief Operating Officer, Wim Newtermans. He's awesome. So he keeps us on track. He organises our commercial contracts. So we get work done um, by specialist people down in Melbourne and, and other places. And yeah, he's just awesome. He's an amazing guy. So, yeah. Um, I think we might just finish now. I think we have a little bit over time, but that's okay. It was a great talk. Thank you. Um, Andrew as well. So please thanks them and thanks for that.